So do you guys remember in a couple videos, I may have mentioned that there's an MLM for literally everything and anything under the sun. So when I start this video telling you guys, saying that, hey, uh, today we're gonna be talking about wine MLMs that maybe you guys are gonna believe me a little bit more because that's literally what we're talking about today. So hello everybody, I'm Blair or the Illuminati. And today we're talking about a genre of MLMs because any one of these companies in particular, I don't think requires a full video. So I'm gonna combine them as one general genre, wine MLMs. Why this exists? I don't know, but this is one of their most interesting ideas yet to turn something that is not an MLM into an MLM. So we're not really gonna focus on one in particular, but we're just gonna take a look at what they're all about how ridiculous the concept actually is, and see if this new brand of Hunbots and Boss Babes are actually going anywhere with these wine sales. So let's get into it. Insider Learning Network says, the concept of utilizing network marketing to promote wine is a great fit, given that wine is incredibly social. Promoting wine for direct selling wine companies while at the same time sipping your favorite red with a bunch of your close friends can easily make the overall experience enjoyable. Not to mention quite lucrative as well. Given the numbers associated with MLMs and how less than 1% of people typically make a like livable working earning wage profit, I'd say that this learning network has definitely got some learning to do. It seems pretty stupid to call it lucrative, but I won't deny that it probably has some appeal for those higher ups. Plus, given the aspect of social drinking, it does fit with the whole home party concepts a lot more than I guess I initially thought. I mean, do I want to go to a home party at all? No, but would I rather drink wine while listening to a Karen talk or get super uncomfortable or bored while she tries to sell me adult toys? Like, I would prefer the wine over the romance toys, just saying. But then again, you also run the risk of signing up or buying a bunch of products that you can't afford because, you know, you're a little tipsy maybe. Still, it definitely sounds like a better home party than looking at Tupperware. To top it all off, I don't need a new batch of adult toys or kitchenware every couple weeks. And I kind of hope nobody does to be totally honest, but I could see people needing a new bottle of wine on a semi-frequent basis at least. So we've established why this concept kind of makes sense, at least through the lens of looking at it from someone who wants to be involved with MLMs. I can absolutely see why to a hun, this would be a great opportunity, hun. What's inherently wrong with this though? Why is this a garbage idea? Well, in my research, I found a podcast hosted by someone called The Recovering Hunbot. And she actually had an episode about MLM wine and featured her friend, Heather, a wine broker with 20 years of experience in the business. And that means that Heather typically sells to large restaurants by representing vineyards, attending wine events. You get the picture, she's legit. After some background to MLMs, we hear Heather mention a wine event and how these Hunbots have allegedly acted. Now again, alleged, and this is coming from Heather, this is not a news report, but I can't really see any reason for her to lie about this either. So I am inclined to believe her. At a charity event, a charity event, by the way, these Huns had their order forms out trying to sell their products. She says, These women, the wine MLMers, were predatory. They came up to people who had our wine in the liquor booth and said, you need to taste our stuff. Getting in their face, we were just really turned off by that. They made these people uncomfortable at a charity event. Like, how tacky can you be? It sounds like Hunbots, all right. Now, as for how wine MLMs operate, there's also some interesting insight Heather provides about the wine itself. First, the recovering Hunbot says, the wine has got to be swill because nobody in their right mind is going to be creating these beautiful boutique wines for MLMs. So what can you tell us about wine in the MLM world? And Heather responds with, I've seen fakes, ones I was very surprised to see, having one of my very boutique vineyards having their label, I was mortified. She used to live in Houston. She used to run a wine bar here. She married this guy who happened to be an assistant winemaker for a very well-known historic Napa Valley vineyard. These wines started at $18 wholesale and went for 35. And that's what they were selling them for on the MLM because they're obviously losing a tremendous amount of money. The amount of juice on the bulk market is pretty insane. One of the wineries I represented, their entire business started on developing a brand. 
they'll get juice on the bulk market and purchase it for pennies. By getting juice, Heather explains, you can fabricate something based on your needs as opposed to buying grapes. The MLMs are getting this juice for a couple dollars and sticking a fancy label on it. She goes on in some more detail about how MLMs will call their wine clean crafted because they say the antihistamines in wine can make you sick. When in actuality, as Heather explains, it's usually the mass produced wines that are at fault here with additives, preservatives, and sugars. And these MLMs are misleading people. It's just a fancy label on dirt cheap wine, bulk juice without a story. I'm not some fancy connoisseur of wine or anything, but the 400 year old vineyard still plowed by horse sounds far more appealing to me than the wine sold by the Hunbot who can't even pronounce the names. And yes, of course, the wine with a story would cost more, but the Hunbots presenting to no wine sounds cringy when they have zero knowledge and tasteless taste. Again, this is just Heather's perspective, but she has a point. For women in smaller towns without local vineyards or wine, they can convince them and say, oh, you've got to buy from your girls. You can't buy from those big box stores because they just don't care. And they can manipulate others quite easily. And it's really frustrating to hear this all again, but I'm not even surprised. This is nothing new. This is how MLMs work. This is how they operate. The supposed actions at charity events, their pushy attitude, and the lack of knowledge about the industry they claim that they're you know, professionals and working in, it all interferes with the real business. So now that we've got just a hint of background as to what these MLMs are about, let's talk about some of the better known ones, what they sell and who they benefit, if anyone. We'll start with Traveling Vineyard. The bottles are cheap and the photos kind of look like stock images just glued onto their bottle. Their claims for one wine being aged up to four months is pretty pathetic. Up to four months could just be a day. There are cheaper bottles online too and the websites that give more information about where they come from and exactly how long they've aged. But again, I'm no wine expert. I can't explain price points and I know it depends on region, age, etc. I don't know. Like we all know that shampoo or a shake pack for some diet trend shouldn't be 50 or $100, but wine prices vary hugely. So I'm sure $20 may be a steal to whatever people fall for the traveling vineyard. As for becoming a wine guide, as the traveling vineyard calls it, they say in plain black and white, you don't have to be a wine expert. Awesome. So traveling vineyard wants someone with no expertise to sell their products. Again, This is so common with MLMs and it really just shows how little they care about their products. It doesn't matter if you don't know a thing about where it comes from, how it's aged, whatever notes of flavor it has, what pairings go with it. No, none of that. Just keep selling the cheap crap and make that downline. Other wineries like E&J Gallo, a random one I just kind of picked off Google, they have a story and a history. They claim to have a passion for quality and when you click on their sales and marketing tab, here's what it says. At e j Gallo Winery, our goal is to deliver superior quality at a great value while providing a positive experience to consumers each and every time they share and enjoy our wines. To achieve this goal, we've assembled teams of highly skilled employees to manage our ever-growing brand portfolio. Our marketing teams collaborate with winemakers and our experts on consumer preferences, as well as other areas of expertise to deliver strong brands to the market, while our sales professionals strive to bring a better wine buying experience to the customer. And would you look at that, just imagine a business that wants their employees to know what they're talking about. I don't even really know this winery, can't vouch for their quality, but at least they've got the common sense to say that rather than their employees just be like whoever off the street, they want them to be educated and knowledgeable, very knowledgeable about the product. Another random vineyard, Duckhorn, has the same attitude. They go into great detail about their story, their history, and its importance. For us, these estate vineyards convey a special sense of place and a growing tradition. Because of this, we take immense pride in their cultivation. We carefully selected a dedicated team to manage our estate properties and have an in-house farming crew comprised of full-time and part-time employees who farm all of our estates. But look, bulk wine isn't going to go into this much detail anyway. Pacificana Wines, a cheaper brand closer to traveling vineyards price point, doesn't seem to care the way Duckhorn or Gallo does. And they're cheaper, I get it, it's fine. They don't have a lengthy, compelling history and that's not really a big deal. But at the very least, they don't pretend they're the best of the best, the way that MLMs certainly seem to do. But back to Traveling Vineyard, they have a video on why our wine guides love their jobs. And it has got to be one of the worst recruitment videos I've seen in a hot minute. So it's kind of interesting. It's so interesting, I love it. They say, as they're all about the five Fs, fun, financial rewards, flexibility, fulfillment, and friends. 
How can you not have fun? It's wine, they say. It makes me feel confident. It makes me a better mom, a better wife. I'm sorry, like, (laughs) I didn't realize that selling cheap grape juice to your friends makes you a better parent, but go off, I guess. The best part is the friendship. You're running your own business. I don't feel like it's a job. If running your own business doesn't feel like work, even in the slightest, maybe it's because you're not running your own business. With YouTube, I can most certainly say I have to run a back end of like business stuff. And while that shit is not super exciting to me or very fun, it is a part of what I have to do in order to have fun making the videos that I make and enjoy the content that I put out there. So I'm just personally not buying that crap. Confidence and friendships are absolutely important. So let me just not discredit that part though. But Heather explained in the podcast that she doesn't need a matching t-shirt to feel part of a community. You can make friends in the wine business, not in this cheap imitation of what they think is the wine industry. It's just a bunch of people drinking and that's fine. Maybe some of your friends in your community just have a dinner party and you know, that's fine. But why do you have to shove a product down someone's throat while you do it? Plus they also say, you'll learn enough to speak at events when in actuality, Heather was calling them out for pronouncing things wrong and clearly not knowing a damn thing about the products that they pitch. So whatever they learn, it's clearly not enough to appease anyone that's actually in the industry and sound legitimate. They might as well have said, you'll be able to bullshit your way through a sale. And scrolling down further, who is their ideal wine guide? Well, this is what the Traveling Vineyard says. We have a diverse community of entrepreneurs from all over the country. From stay-at-home moms to weekend side hustlers, retirees fulfilling a passion and hobbyists looking to learn. People looking for career alternatives and people looking for a personal challenge. Most of them like wine and very, very few of them start out as wine experts. And I just love how that is something that they turned into a selling point. Like if you have a wine business and almost no wine experts want to sign up or join you, doesn't that say just just something about your business? Like there might be some problems as in, I don't know, maybe you don't pay real salaries. The chance of failing is astronomical, cult-like environment. Hell, maybe it's because they went bankrupt in 2010, nine years after the company was founded, then restarted the business as an MLM to try and make money again. I don't know, just, just a couple ideas off the top of my head. But the point is that there's endless possibilities as to why a business expert or a wine expert wouldn't join this type of business. And of course, there's plenty of more where that came from. Another wine MLM called Wine Shop at Home is pretty well known actually. And they look almost exactly like Traveling Vineyard with the same story. Though they also make the very bold claim that there are no other wines like ours on earth. That's a promise. And I'm just gonna say that I really, really doubt that. I clicked on their awards to try and get to the bottom of how the hell they could have won something. And well, guess what? The wine shop at home claims that Glory Cellars 2017 Napa Valley Heroes Blend won gold in the Sunset International Wine Competition. To the average person, that sounds amazing, right? Seriously, it's impressive, especially considering there's 2,700 entries. So this wine has to be delicious. Well, that's not actually the case at all. Now, keep in mind that I am no wine expert here, but Every wine I saw on the competition results was scored and given points. Most wines had silver or gold, and it was only double gold or best in show that were actually impressive standout wines. Bronze doesn't mean third place here, so I didn't see a single bronze ranking for this particular competition. Silver was the lowest rank, so it meant it was drinkable, I guess. Gold was like average or okay, and double gold was better than average, and best of class or best in show were the noteworthy ranks. So they are not lying when they say they've gotten gold. It's just not as impressive once you actually look into what it actually means. It's not a standout, it's not a first place wine, but I'd be willing to bet that Hunbots who don't know any better are gonna brag about that thing up and downtown. As for their wines, yeah, they look cheap. And I'm not sure why the label is illegible all over it or what the design was meant to be, but that's what they're going with. So that's the aesthetic here. To me, as a consumer, it is not personally appealing. If I saw that kind of wine on a shelf, I would probably discredit it and go look at a different wine because that just doesn't bring me any confidence. That is my personal opinion on that. Perhaps this label interests you a little bit more. It does not have that effect for me though. So here's the other funny thing though, is when you sign up to be a consultant, it also costs $25 for literally nothing. 
Yeah, it's a virtual pop-up kit. It's a personalized website, mobile app access, and wine cellar access for training resources, and a social media suite of tools. So in other words, you pay to have your website, which when it's all for MLMs, is really just their site with your name in the corner and you're still paying for all the training. So that was a bit yikesy for me to find out. But you know, it's a big red flag for me, clearly not a big red flag for other people. And of course, under their FAQs, when asked if you know a lot about wine, here's what they say. Nope, no wine expertise or experience is required. We have great wine resources for your tastings that will guide you through the different wines you are presenting. We also have specific training to give you all the tools you need to help you feel comfortable and confident. Okay, so back to the matter of training. What is this training? Is it just a few weeks at a job site, attending events? Well, here's what Wine Shop says. Your upline leader will make sure you have the training and help you need to start off right and continue to be successful. You'll also have access to training resources, weekly training calls, training videos, guidance from your peers, and help from our dedicated IWC care team to help support you in your new wine adventure. It's almost comical because like, imagine you have someone that knows nothing about wine whatsoever. Maybe they even have a bunch of misconceptions about it. They pronounce everything wrong and they're unwilling to learn. But somehow this person gets their hands on a downline. Is that really the best teacher? Like, honestly. I mean, for God's sake, even the average person, even I would be a horrible leader in this type of position because I don't know enough about wine to properly educate someone about it. I have not done my proper research on wine, but Wine Shop operates this way, just like every other MLM because it's less work for them and they don't care about the product and they clearly don't care about the training to begin with. It seems way more of a way to amp people up to be sellers than to actually be productive or, you know, to learn. As for the rest of Wine Shop's operations, it doesn't really get much better. In 2015, Diane Nozick came out with an article on the Wine Shop lifestyle, and here's what she wrote. A lot of new consultants, and heck, let's face it, really established consultants, feel a little awkward when they tell a new host that yes, they have to pay for their party. I'll be honest, it was weird for me at first too. It felt totally strange that I would be in a home party business that I was asking to host and pay for her party. Many wine shop at home consultants who started in direct sales with other companies find this strange as well. In order to host a party with wine shop at home, the host must pay $29.95 plus tax and shipping. In exchange for that fee, the host receives five full-size bottles of wine plus a six that they can keep for themselves or share. As our bottles average $20 each, that's at least a $120 value. Not only that, but the host also receives our gift of the month plus additional benefits and discounts, accessories, and wine club discounts. Needless to say, there's a lot of benefit in that $29.95. So does the host get wine for cheap? Absolutely. But considering Heather speculated these wines cost just a few bucks to make in the first place, it's more like getting them wholesale. And it's not a good look to tell your friend, doing you a favor by hosting this party, that she has to buy five bottles wholesale before she can be considered. If these Huns are going to get that financial independence and freedom that we see so many brag about and desperately want, then how come you have to cover costs for your own party like this? Like, isn't this someone owning a business? Like, I don't know. I just, I wouldn't see a business owner do this. Like they pay to rent out spaces, not the other way around. Legally, the host needs to own the wine. If the host is the owner of the wine, it frees the consultant to show up and help her throw a fun educational event instead of being a bartender. It also keeps wine shop consultants from having to apply for a license to sell alcohol. When a host presents resistance, when you tell him or her that they must pay for their own wine, you can gently remind them all the reasons listed above. If they are hosting any other sort of party, they would have to purchase wine, and this way they get a much lower rate. Besides, what host doesn't want to keep the leftover wine? This way she or he gets to enjoy the leftovers. I don't know anyone who isn't excited about that prospect. And I personally, Don't think I'd get too excited about that. Me, I don't want any of the leftover cheap crap wine, thanks. Plus the fact that you don't have a license, that's not a plus. What's with these MLMs thinking that the way they cut corners is like fantastic and something to brag about, like it's some amazing selling point. Selling wine to strangers in their home when they had to pay for you to be there without a license is not exactly what I'd call a great business. But again, real businesses don't operate this way either. To top it all off, between June and November, 2017, Tina.org investigated every company on November 29th, 2017 direct selling association membership list and found that there were more than 97% have made or are making 
either directly or through their distributors, false and unsubstantiated income claims to promote the company's business opportunity. Wine Shop, unsurprisingly, was no exception. There's over 20 posts about income claims from Tina.org, none of them verified, each one a pushy hun trying to gain a downline. I know we see this all the time, but I mean, like, is it just me or does anyone else just find this slightly weird when it comes to alcohol? Like, who constantly nags their friends to drink? Direct Sellers, another wine MLM, thankfully got the right idea last year and stopped with the pyramid scheme-ish model. Hell, they even seemed to shut down completely, which is another win in my book. Another called the Boyset Collection requires $149 spent to get started at the bare minimum. A subscription and training is yet again from the upline. Now, they do seem to have some more credibility than other MLMs on the surface anyway, because their founder, Jean-Charles Boisset is from France and that family estates, they do have legitimate wine cellars. So funny enough that they're actually connected to that website we mentioned earlier, the winery Ian J. Gallo, and I swear to fuck, I didn't plan this, but Jean-Charles Boisset is married to Gina Gallo, the third generation face of the family of Ian J. Gallo. It just really shows the difference between Boisset and his wife, I guess. They were both born into wineries and families that cared about the industry, but one of them chose an MLM, and the other didn't. As a result, the Gallo name, while far from perfect, is still considered acclaimed, award-winning, and a pioneer in the art of grape growing, winemaking, sustainable practices, marketing, and worldwide distribution. Boisset's just living off his family name and desperate hunbots. And he's doing a poor job of that too, considering he's been involved in a class action lawsuit. In 2015, this lawsuit stated that the wines in question, Boisset's name listed among the name of other producers, had unusually high levels of inorganic arsenic in them. In some cases, five times higher than the legal limit. So, you know, that's a great look. (laughs) I'm pretty sure arsenic is number one on my list of things I don't want in my drink, but thank you anyway. Even sources that don't call them a scam and try to give them the benefit of the doubt don't really have kind words for them either. Here's what affiliate resources said. No matter how much you love wine, signing up to be an ambassador for the Boisette collection could cost you a fortune before you make a penny. The Social Light kit comes with three bottles of wine to get you started, but that will be gone in your first tasting. There's also those hidden costs that you need to keep in mind, like Cellar Suite monthly subscription that will eat into your profits and stemware you may want to have on hand for your tastings. Another wine MLM, Scout and Cellar, also especially focuses on that clean crafted factor and uses this as a selling point. Sure, that may sound enticing, but saying how they have less than 100 parts per million of sulfites isn't nearly as impressive as you'd think. Sulfites are naturally occurring compounds found in all wines. They act as a preservative by inhibiting microbial growth. They're in molasses, dried fruit, a bunch of stuff. Asthmatics can have an allergic reaction and sometimes people wrongly blame sulfites, but this doesn't make it a yucky chemical like Scout and Cellar puts it. And yes, they've actually used the word yucky on their about clean crafted page. I'm not fucking kidding you. Shape.com even says, for 95% of people, sulfates are A-OK. Sulfates in wine are naturally created during the fermentation process when sulfur dioxide and water, which is 80% of wine, mix. So the first very important thing to note is that all wine, even if it's labeled sulfate-free, wine naturally has sulfates and all these wine health benefits. While ditching additives in your foods and eating as naturally as possible is usually a great thing, you actually want a little sulfite compounds in your wine. They act as an antimicrobial, so you don't get any nasties in there that would make it taste foul or turn into vinegar, says Jennifer Simulti Bryan, a master of wine, the highest wine title in the world and author of Rosé Wine, The Guide to Drinking Pink. Since all wine naturally has sulfates, you may see sulfate-free wine, but it's a bunch of BS, says Simonetti. What they really mean is no added sulfates. Wine.com confirms there's no such thing as 100% sulfite-free wine. You can find no sulfate added wines in most liquor stores labeled NSA or no sulfite added, but read on to see why you probably don't need to care about sulfates in your wine anyway. Plus, this is no more than 100 parts per million Scout and Cellar says isn't even the least impressive because wines low in sulfites are everywhere and wines that have sulfites above 10 parts per million are required to be labeled. Plus, according to Wine Folly, it's only about five to 10% of asthmatics that tend to suffer from this sulfite sensitivity. So sure, 
Low in sulfite wines is great to have for these people, but Scout and Cellar acting as if we should all be avoiding sulfites is extremely misleading. Between the sulfite misconceptions and the one in a 100 chance that you'll even make what you spend back, the arsenic lawsuits, the cheap crappy wine, and the overall fact that it's still an MLM, I can't really see myself stomaching any of this wine. Now, I myself, like I said, not an expert on wine, far from it, but this sounds like a terrible idea. Another two industries that go extremely awful together, MLMs and alcohol. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's video. If you guys enjoyed it or learned something today, make sure to hit that like button. If you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe. If you want more content from me, including the sources used to create this video, my social media, my like other channels and projects I'm involved with, yada, 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 links for literally everything will be in the description box down below. So again, guys, thank you so much for making it to another video. Love you and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Mm-hmm.